Hello everyone, I'm Chen Xiongguo from Microsoft Research. This presentation is about our experiences running RDMA over commodities net at large scale. So this is a joint work with my colleagues Hai Tao, Zhong, Garav, Jianxi, Jitu, and Marina. So this is the outline of the talk. It has six parts. So we'll be focusing on the safety challenges and the experiences and the lessons that we have learned. So let me start from the background. So TCP is still the dominating transport protocol for data center applications. TCP introduces large latency, latency tail, and high CPU cost due to the software-based packet processing in the OS kernel and the packet drop handling. So our motivation of introducing RDMA is to address those issues faced by TCP. So RDMA eliminates kernel packet processing by offloading its transport layer to the NIC, and it gets rid of packet drops by using a lossless network. So our data centers are built on top of ethernet. Therefore, our choice of RDMA is uh, RDMA over commodity ethernet, Rocky v2. So in Rocky v2, we have introduced the connection level DCQCN congestion control protocol, which we have presented in previous year CCOM. So Rocky v2 further uses a class-based hop-by-hop flow control protocol called Priority Flow Control, PFC, to guarantee no packet drops. So PFC is a single flow control protocol between a sender and a receiver. So packets are divided into up to eight prior priority classes. So every data packet carries a priority, which is embedded in the VLAN tag. Therefore, we call the protocol VLAN-based PFC. So once the buffer of the ingress queue of the receiver exceeds a threshold due to the congestion, the receiver sends a pulse frame to the sender. So after the sender receives the pulse frame, it will stop sending data packets for that corresponding priority. So the VLAN-based PFC, however, does not work well for us for two reasons. First, VLAN-based PFC breaks PXE boot. So in order to support VLAN, the server-facing ports of the switch needs to be put into the trunk mode in which the switch ports can send and receive packets with the VLAN tags. So in all data centers, OS installation and an upgrade are all through PXE boot. So when servers do PXE boot, the NICs, however, cannot send and receive VLAN tag packets. So PXE boot therefore fails. Second, our networks are layer 3 networks up to the top of rack switches. So in a layer 3 network, there's no standard way for carrying the layer 2 VLAN tag. Our key observation here is that the PFC pulse frame does not need a VLAN tag at all, and that we have a much better place to carry priority uh, in the IP world. That's the DSCP field in the IP header. So our solution is to use the DSCP field to carry the priority value. So we call our solution DSCP based PFC. The PXC boot issue and the priority preservation problem simply go away in DSCP based PFC as there is no VLAN at all. So we have worked with the major switch and the NIC providers to support DSCP based PFC. Next, let me present the safety challenges and how we addressed them. So the first challenge we run into is the RDMA transport level lock. We used a simple experiment to unveil the problem. We had a RDMA sender and a RDMA receiver, and they are connected to the same switch. We let the sender continu continuously send four megabyte messages to the receiver. So we configured the switch to drop one packet in every 256 packets. So what we observed is that the good put was zero, but the throughput measured from the switch was 9 rate 40 gigabit per second per port. What happened was as follows. So in this experiment, a 4 megabit message was divided into 4,000 packets, and we were dropping one packet over 256 packets. So the sender implements uh, a go back zero for packet retransmission. So once a packet was dropped, the sender started over from transmitting the first packet. 
go back zero, resulting into the never lock. So the sender is busy transmitting without any progress. So our solution to this problem is to change the go back zero implementation to go back n. Instead of starting from the first packet, go back n starts from the dropped packet. So by doing so, progress is guaranteed, so level lock is avoided. So the second challenge we met is the PFC deadlock. So we once thought that we should not have deadlock in our lock because uh, we use class network. Um, so in, in our network, packet first go up, then go down. Uh, so there is no cyclic buffer dependency, which is the necessary condition for deadlock. But we did run into deadlocks in our test, test bed network. So before we dive into the details on how the deadlock happened, let me first introduce some layer 3 switching preliminaries. So in a layer 3 uh, switch, there are two tables. So one is an up table, which maps a destination IP address to a MAC address. The other one is a MAC table, which maps a MAC address to an output port number. So both tables use timers to evict outdated entries. So once a received packet can get its next top MAC address, but not the physical port number, the packet is flooded to all the rest of ports. PFC together with packet flooding can cause the deadlock as we show in this example. So server S1 is sending purple packets to S3 and black packets to S5 through the parse T0 IOA T1. So S3 is dead, so the purple packets are flooded to all the ports in T1. So port T1 P2 is congested, so the black packets cannot be drained. As a result, port T1 P3 begins to pulse IOA. Consequently, IOA begins to pulse T0, and T0 begins to pulse S1. At the same time, Server S4 is sending blue packets to server S2 along the paths T1, LB, T0. S2, unfortunately, is also dead. As a result, the blue packets are also flooded to all the ports in T0, including P2. Since T0, P2 is a post, once enough blue packets are accumulated in T0, P3, PFC pulses will be generated from T0 to LB, then from LB to T1, and T1 to S4. So now we got a problem. The pulses among the four switches form a loop and result in a deadlock. The root cause of the PFC deadlock is the unexpected interactions between uh, the PFC flow control and the Ethernet packet flooding. So we have explored many possible solutions to this problem. So the solution we finally choose is a simple one. Drop the notch list packet at the tour if the up entry becomes incomplete. We recommend that we should not do packet flooding or packet multicasting for lost list traffic. We further call for more research on deadlocks in the data center networking context. So the second, the third challenge, the NIC PFC pulse frame storm involves a malfunctioning NIC. So in this scenario, the malfunctioning NIC is sending pulse frames to its upstream tor all the time. So the tor then pulses all its labors. The labors further pulses all their labors. This continues until the whole network is paused. So we have experienced several leak pulse frame storms in our production networks, and we have worked with the leak providers to fix the bugs that caused the storm. To further minimize the impact of such storm, we have introduced watchdogs at both the leaks and the tour switches to stop the storm once such storm is detected. So the last but not least challenge we run into is the slow receiver symptom. In our network, the NIC connects to the tool using 40 gigabit per second QSFP interface, and the NIC connects to the server host YPCIE Gen3 with 64 gigabit per second bandwidth. Hence, in theory, the NIC should not send out the pulse frames 
to the tour as there seems no bottleneck between the nick and the server. But we did observe that the nicks may generate a large number of post frames to the tour. So there must be some hidden bottleneck in the nick. So there is indeed one. So the nick we use is resource constrained and it stores a small number of its data structure in the nick and all the rest in the main memory. It needs a memory translation table, MTT, for accessing the main memory. So once there's a local data structure missing or MTT entry missing, the receiving pipeline needs to stop and wait for the NIC to fetch the data from the main memory. So this results in post frames um, being generated by the NIC. We call this phenomenon the slow receiver symptom. So to mitigate, we use notch page size for the MTD table uh, to reduce MTD entry missing. And we further uh, introduced dynamic buffer sharing at the tools to reduce the chance of post frame propagation. So next, I will share our experiences and the lessons that we have learned running Rocky V2 in our worldwide data centers. So here we show the latency numbers we measured for both RDMA and the TCP in our production data centers for latency sensitive service. As we show here, even the 99.9th percentile latency of RDMA is much smaller than the 99th percentile latency of TCP. Also, we would like to note that since RDMA is lossless, it completely solves packet drops due to the in-cast traffic pattern, which is pervasive in our data center applications. Next, we measure the RDMA throughput for data shuffling between two post sets of servers. So each post set has more than five, 500 servers. The total bandwidth between the two post sets is five terabit per second. So RDMA achieved three terabit per second. This is 60% of the network capacity. We did not achieve even higher network utilization because of the harsh collision of the ECMP routing. So servers used close to zero CPU overhead when shuffling three terabit per second aggregate throughput. So this experiment further studies the latency and the throughput trade-off in RDMA. So similar to the previous experiment, we let the servers shuffle RDMA traffic between two tour switches. We measured end-to-end -end RDMA latency before and during the data shuffling. The figure clearly shows that both the 99th percentile and the 99.9th percentile RDMA latencies increased significantly when data shuffling got started. So this experiment shows that even with RDMA, low latency and high throughput cannot be achieved at the same time as network congestion can cause queues build up in, in the network. So after all the challenges and the experiences, um, let me briefly summarize the lessons that we have learned. As we have shown that better things, including dead locks, never locks, PFC post frame storms can all happen. So the best way to deal with those better things is to be prepared for them. So we have built RDMA configuration management, RDMA latency and availability monitoring, so PFC post frame monitoring and RDMA traffic monitoring into our production network. Those services are indispensable for us to run RDMA safely. So we also have learned the lesson that the NICs are the key to make Rocky V2 work. The time we spent on the NICs was much more than the time we spent on the switches. So a lossless network is much harder to build and to do it right than a lossy network. For those who are brave enough to try lossless networking, we have accumulated many experiences for them in this paper. The related work. So besides Rocky V2, there are two additional technologies in Filiband and iWarp, which can also provide RDMA. So we chose Rocky V2 because Ethernet and IP are other technologies we use for data centers, and they have been proven to be scalable. And more importantly, Rocky V2 
is compatible with our existing systems and the networking stack. There are many studies on network deadlocks tens of years ago. So in this work, we show that deadlock can happen in the Ethernet-based data centers. So finally, compared with various TCP performance tuning, we have shown that Rocky V2 can do much better. For example, Rocky V2 directly eliminates the in-cast problem caused because packet, packets do not drop. To conclude, we have shown that by introducing DSP-based PFC and by addressing various safety issues and bugs, we can run Rocky V2 safely at a nice scale in Microsoft production data centers. There are several directions for future work, including RDMA for inter-data center communications, deeper understanding of the data logs in data centers, low latency and high throughput networking for lossless networks, and how to transform more applications to use RDMA uh, from TCP. With that, I will stop here, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.